Hello, um, my name's Gabrielle. I'll just get to my slide. I'm a paediatric dentist here in Adelaide, um, and I've been working at the Women's and Children's Hospital for probably the last eight years or so, and been very fortunate um, to be involved in the care with many children with complex cardiac disease, and to see a lot of those children now turn 18 and transition into adult care as well. Um, so I'm just going to um, really give some general information about oral health um, and, and dentistry, um, and I guess the oral health status of our, our children here in Australia at the moment. So a bit of a summary of slides. We'll go through what is oral health, um, contributors to poor oral health, the oral health of our children in Australia, some dental caries risk factors and, and how that can be um, more specific to certain children, um, periodontal disease and cardiovascular health, um, a bit about endocarditis prophylaxis, some access to care and some recommendations. How do we achieve and maintain our oral health? I'm sorry. Just me... So the World Dental Federation talks about oral health as a multifaceted um, condition. It includes the ability to speak, smile, taste, smell, touch, chew, swallow and convey a range of emotions through facial expressions with confidence and without pain or discomfort or disease in the craniofacial complex. So it is more than just being cavity or periodontal or gingivitis free. Um, we want to have a smile that everyone's we're confident to, to smile and communicate with our teeth. We want to be um, you know, proud of our smile and, and able to use our teeth doing all the things we need to do. And then the World Health Organization is along a similar sort of range there too, talking about oral health as being a state of being free from mouth and facial pain, oral and throat cancer, oral infection and sores, periodontal or gum disease, tooth decay, tooth loss and other diseases or disorders that limit our ability um, to bite, chew, smile, speak and our psychosocial wellbeing as well. So just going through the contributors to poor oral health, um, the main things we hear about are our gingivitis and gum disease or decay, um, but we see a lot of children that have had significant traumatic injuries um, to their dentition that has significantly affected their oral health. Children get viral infections um, that can be displayed in the mouth. There's dental anomalies too, so this could be an anomaly in the enamel or the dentine, but also the numbers of teeth um, and the way the teeth form, um, oral cancer and then some fungal infections too. So just our oral health of children in Australia, um, this slide I've just grabbed some statistics that I think really um, make it clear that we're not free of dental disease and dental caries recently has increased in our Australian children, but just over 40% of children aged 5 to 10 have experienced decay in their primary teeth. And on average, they have one and a half decayed teeth. And this next factor, the one in blue, is one that really sort of brings home to me. There's a quarter of Australian children aged five to 10 that have untreated decay in their primary teeth. So this is teeth that, that have a hole in it. It hasn't been filled. So it just shows the importance of regular routine dental care and getting things checked, thoroughly checked, x-rays, clinical exam, and having things restored and fixed up at an early stage. And then when we look at the adult dentition, um, it's a little bit better, um, but just over 25% of children aged 6 to 14 have experienced decay in their permanent teeth. On average, it's half a decayed tooth per, children, or per child sorry, in Australia. But what's interesting too, 10% of children aged 6 to 14 have untreated decay in their mouth. So this is an open carious lesion that does need a restoration or management that hasn't been treated. Dental risk factors. Um, so we think about decay and we think about the sugars and all the things we shouldn't eat and we think about bacteria, but there's a few other things that play part too. And it pays to think of decay a bit like balancing a scale. Um, there's lots of different factors that contribute to us getting disease and it, it's not necessarily that we're eating foods we shouldn't be eating and not brushing our teeth. So yeah, we need the sugars and we do need some bacteria there, but you also need a susceptible host or tooth. So children with cardiac, um, chronic cardi uh, congenital cardiac disease do have more enamel defects. There's research that's been shown. So on average in Australia, probably 20% of kids will have an enamel defect or part of their enamel that's a little bit weaker or didn't form as well. In our sick kids, that can be as high as 80% of the population of children um, with childhood illnesses can have these problems. Now these weaker area of enamel, areas of enamel when the teeth come into the occlusion and they're in use and they bite, they can chip and break. And then you're much more prone to getting decay in these areas. So when you think about the scale, if you've got a really susceptible tooth, we're going to have to do lots of things on the preventative side to try and prevent getting a hole in that tooth. Um, so that's where there's a picture there of a product called tooth mousse. Um, so our tooth structure, the, the strong part of enamel, is basically made of fluoride and calcium and phosphate. What the tooth mousse does is it takes some calcium and phosphate into the oral environment and helps strengthen any of these weaker areas of enamel. So a lot of our kids will get them brushing with a fluoridated toothpaste, 
but also putting this tooth mousse on afterwards just to really strengthen and, and help keep everything really strong. And our saliva is really protective as well. I put time in the middle there too because these things don't happen. They can happen quickly, um, but you, you don't get decay um, just because you have you know, one bad day or the kids go to the show and, and have a, a bit of a sugar hit and whatnot. Um, it, it takes time. So if we can keep things in the, the healthy balance over a period of time, we're going to have more repair rather than damage. We're not as likely to have an issue from, from decay in our teeth. We look at periodontal disease. Um, there's been relationships with periodontal disease and our cardiovascular health. So just wanted to explain, explain a little bit about periodontal disease. Um, it really means that the structures holding the tooth in or supporting the tooth um, have become diseased and weakened. And this again, it's a chronic condition and we, we sort of get, accumulate the damage over our life. So it does start in childhood and adolescence and it will start with gingivitis. So if we've got plaque sitting up near our, our gums on our, our teeth, you see that the gums get a little bit inflamed. Over time, that plaque might become sort of calcified and become what they call, the dentist might call it tartar or calculus, but that just means that the, the bugs and the plaque have become sort of mineralized from being in the oral environment. And then you get the swollen gum, so you get a little bit of a pocket or an area where things are collecting. And then over time, again, your body has the inflammation with the gingivitis, but then you actually start to get breakdown of bone and the attachment of the tooth, um, which is holding the tooth into the jaws, essentially. And this damage accumulates. It's not reversible once it starts happening. So one thing with our, our children, our child patients, is we, we talk about flossing and proximal cleaning and, and regular dental visits because if we can prevent getting to this state where we have got the bone breakdown, we're going to have a really healthy periodontium in our later adult years. Um, so from there. Um, and it has been shown that periodontal disease can be associated with um, sort of our cardiovascular disease. So it's an aside, but it's also really important that we, we do maintain our periodontal health because we don't want to have any other types of cardiovascular disease developing um, if we can help with that too. I'm sorry. Yeah. And when we go to infective endocarditis, I've um, just got a definition there, um, but it just talks about when we get infection of either the heart's lining or the heart valves. It is fortunately quite uncommon, um, but there's two things that can increase our risk. So having pathogens in the blood, but also high risk heart conditions. And so we have resident flora in our mouth and they can enter our bloodstream doing everyday things, chewing, brushing teeth and whatnot. But one thing that, that can increase it is having an invasive dental or medical procedure, which is when we'll talk about our prophylaxis coming up. Um, but the bacteria can settle on the abnormal or damaged um, prosthetic or prosthetic heart tissue, and then can cause further damage. It is quite a rare complication, but it's one with dentistry that we are aware of, and we will often look at sort of endocarditis prophylaxis. So this has been quite a long-standing practice in America and Australia. Um, there's been some recent changes in the UK, if anyone reads anything there. They've moved away from prophylaxis for invasive dental procedures, but we still do it here in Australia. And it's based on the rationale that we can, um, if we can prevent um, the bacteria or bacteremia um, from an invasive dental procedure um, in a patient with a predisposing heart condition and hopefully we can reduce their risk of, of having such a complication. Um, and we want to destroy the bacteria that are circulating um, in the bloodstream. So we just give one single dose an hour before a, a dental procedure just to cover for that, that time of the procedure. And these are the um, conditions in Australia by our guidelines um, that we look at now and relevant today is our um, cyanotic cardiac defects. Um, so um, most moving forward, a lot of um, people that have had Fontan procedures or most would probably have um, antibiotic prophylaxis. And as a dentist, we'll just get in touch with the cardiologist and, and check um, what their recommendation is. And it's usually orally, just one hour before is sufficient. Um, another thing with dentistry when we're talking about um, endocarditis prophylaxis is, is the blood thinners. Um, as dentists, even extracting teeth, um, patients on warfarin, we are happy um, for you to continue on your warfarin. We will talk to your um, cardiologist about this as well, but as long as the INR is within our, our safe range or range that we're happy to work within between our 2.2 and our 4, um, we can use local measures to control um, any sort of bleeding or, or issues from the, the dental point of view. But if we are able to cease it, if we had quite an involved dental procedure, then we could work through that as well. And then just going through access to care because sometimes the 
Access to dental care is a little bit different to our medical care. Tried to make a little bit of a diagram for how things work here in South Australia. Um, so the tertiary, tertiary referral hospital setting up the top is the children's department. And we can be, have patients referred in to us from the public or private sector. And you can be referred in by your cardiologist or medico, um, or even from your general dentist um, if you're eligible for care with us. In the private sector, there's paediatric dentists. So they're dentists that have done their five years of dental training, but then have done further education in the field of paediatrics, working a lot with um, a lot of sick children. Um, and they'll sort of have that specialist qualification um, to provide a little bit more specialised care. But in saying that, a good general practitioner that's aware of your child's background, um, you know, may be well equipped to provide absolutely adequate care. And then there's therapists as well. In the school dental service or the public sector at the moment, there is a sort of combination of dentists and therapists. The, the tricky thing with navigating the school dental service at the moment is, is a lot of children are seen by therapists and it's often not clear to the parents if you are seeing a dentist or a therapist. So you, you can ask, um, you know, are, are you the dentist looking after my child or a therapist and who's the dentist overseeing you? And if, if you did feel that your child needed to be seen um, within the hospital, um, then, then just ask and advocate for that and, and see if that is something that we can sort out. Um, and in saying that too, you might have somewhere that you um, go as a family to the dentist and you have your regular care, but your child might need something quite um, significant done, might need a general anaesthetic for some dental treatment. That can be coordinated in the hospital setting um, so that you know we've got extra precautions in place and an excellent paediatric anaesthetist providing that side of the care to get that bit of dental treatment done and then transition care back to your local setting as well. And then just some take home messages that dental caries and periodontal disease can be prevented and that's the, the best way really to address these issues. If, if we can maintain excellent oral health, have a really good, they call it a dental home, but if you have a dentist that you see strictly, I'd, anyone um, that's had a Fontan type procedure, I'd want to be them being seen every three to six months um, just for regular checkups, make sure we're staying on top of things um, and try and prevent any potential problems or complications before they arise. Um, so establish that dental home from a young age. We advocate that every child should have their first dental visit before 12 months of age. Um, and that dental treatment in young children can frequently require sedation or general anesthesia. So make sure that the people providing this care are well aware of the medical history. And if you've got any concerns or questions, just ask or ask the practitioner to be in touch with your GP or cardiologist to make sure that everything's put in place to make sure everything does progresses really smoothly, and that maintaining excellent oral hygiene and preventable practice is the best way to avoid or reduce any potential oral complications. Thank you.